Welcome to the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. This is episode 164, where we get into Clive Barker and Hellraiser news, including Hellraiser Judgment. We talk about our Kickstarter and what cool things are still left that you can buy. So we've got a lot of cool Clive Barker stuff. Um, We talk about... um, And then our last thing is a discussion of the 1992 mini-documentary Clive Barker, The Art of Horror. Uh, You can watch it in the link at the bottom and uh, let us know what you think, too. Um, you could back then you could only see it by sending away proof of proof of purchase from your VHS of Hellraiser 3 uh, I think it was later also a, a, a feature a featurette in the Hellraiser 3 DVD and then blu-ray hey welcome back uh, this is our first episode of 2018. That's right. And uh, as usual, I'm Joe. I'm Ryan. I'm Dave. So welcome to this uh, episode 164, where we're going to be talking about some Clive Barker news and the documentary Clive Barker, The Art of Horror. Yeah. Yeah. So in the news, I guess, first thing, and it seems pretty real, uh, but there was an announcement or not really an announcement, but on Amazon.com, Hellraiser Judgment just kind of showed up. And you can pre-order it. Yep. Um, so it's it's going to be an unrated version. Um, you can pre-order your copy. And the tentative date there is February 13 of 2018. So if you want to go there and pre-order, I think it's a good time to do it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's only like $18, so it's it's not yeah. bad. Yeah, right. I guess depending yeah. on, on your point of view, I remember. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like whatever Hellraiser <clears throat> Revelations cost in the beginning was, you know, now we know it was way too much. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is true. But this one, so, uh, we don't know. I mean, it, it, I'm I'm more excited for this one definitely than Hellraiser Judgment, cause, or I mean, yeah. than Hellraiser Revelations. Because I thought, at the time, I remember thinking it's probably going to be as bad as, as uh, Hellraiser 8. Um, which one was that? The Hellworld? Yes, and, and then it turned out to be worse by a lot, yeah. which was really surprising. <laughs> which who knew it could go even yeah. even deeper down? But it seems like yeah. with, with this one, they're they're trying some new things, and and um, and Paul Taylor is excited about it. So there's some hope that it you know might be it might have been you know it might be different enough that the lower budget doesn't matter. And I, I want to do a little bit of breaking news here. I don't know if we mentioned this before, um, but I was just looking up Amazon and I discovered that Hellraiser with the Toll, the no- novel with uh, Mark uh, from Mark Miller, is on Amazon as well. And there's a date for it, it to, which is February 28, 2018, oh, okay. for the release. Yeah, nice. he, he told us yeah. February, but he didn't tell us a day. So that's that is breaking news. Yep, so February 28th, mark it on your calendars. It's a, a small novel from uh, Mark Miller, and it takes us back to Kirsty and Binhead and Devil's Island. So uh, go read our reviews of the uh, um, author's um, advanced reading copy. I'm, I'm sorry. Go read our review of the advanced reading copy. I think the book has changed a little bit since then. There was some work done to it to change a few things. So uh, we'll be keeping our eyes posted for that one. How cool is that that uh, 2018 is hitting hard with Hellraiser stuff right out the I gate? Know. I, I know. That it, it's been like the 30th anniversary. Yeah. Yeah, it just yeah. keeps on rolling even though it's now it's 2018. They're like, it, <laughs> just keep on going. Uh, that's true, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I will uh, ev- eventually pre-order uh, Hellraiser Judgment, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. I mean, you know, it's a second, it's a second attempt for Gary Tunnicliffe to – come up with something that he's involved with a uh, hellraiser of his own. But, uh, you know, uh, I like the images I've been seeing of Paul T. Taylor as pinhead. I mean, no disrespect to Doug Bradley, but you know, Hey, let's, let's see what, uh, what he brought to the role. Yeah. Plus yeah. you can't help but be excited when you see and hear the excitement that, you know, Atkins and, uh, Paul T. Taylor have had over this project. Cause when revelations came out, it just, kind of came out no one really said anything and 
So at least with this one, there's at least a little bit of excitement, you know, from the people that worked on the film. Yeah. And it seems like it's Lionsgate, Lionsgate Studios that's releasing the film. I was just Yeah, I saw that on Rob's article. That's that's weird, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I wonder if they just wanted quick money, you know, and they're just yeah. like, okay, you guys get distribution rights. I mean, some people were thinking that Lionsgate has the entire, you know, IP, and I kind of doubt that. I think they just wanted somebody that could distribute distribute it fast, and they could get quick money, you know, even though yeah. they would have made more money if they'd done it, released it themselves, but they've got bigger things to worry about. Yeah, and we all know Lionsgate doesn't really put a whole lot into their Blu-ray releases, so yeah. they can churn them out pretty quickly. So they spent all their money on that fancy thing with the gears and the gates and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that just sets me a little aback about this is that there's still no image available for the 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 cover of Hellraiser Judgment I in the know. Amazon page. Yeah, yeah that's next, why I won't pre-order it. Next, next month. <laughs> I know, and I'm like, why is there no image? I mean, nobody's made a cover for this yet. I find it hard to believe. You know, I hope that yeah. uh, it, it's not going to be a super bare bones release, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, discs I, should be being pressed pretty soon here, so yeah, you would think there's got to be artwork. I pre-ordered it just because it might go up to thirty bucks, you know, in a little while. So I wanted. Oh yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> Definitely don't want to spend thirty on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't, yeah. So another bit of news is that uh, uh, Phil and Sarah Stokes and the Clyde Barker Archive are releasing another couple of play scripts uh, based on, um, from Clyde Barker previously unpublished uh, plays that he did uh, back in the 70s and stuff. So the two new play scripts they're putting out is Hunter in the Snow and Crazy Face. I mean, Crazy Face is not unpublished, but uh, Hunter in the Snow definitely is. And yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Hunter in the Snow is from like 1973. That that might be the oldest or one of the oldest published uh, plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about it is that it includes a character called the Dutchman, uh, who was originally played by Doug Bradley on the stage, and uh, and that Clive would later see echoes of in the dialogue and bearing of Hellraiser's lead centibite Pinhead. That's cool. So, yeah, mm -hmm. these, these kind that of is. characters, these, these kind of big monolithic characters who just, you know, there used to be also a, a patriarch in the play Dog, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. There was also a guy with a big padded costume and stuff like that. And, and he, you know, was kind of this this uh, this monolithic character as well. So there's always been kind of this presence in, in Clyde Barker's stories, uh, whether it's Mamoulian or Pinhead, this, this main, you know, kind of imposing <clears throat> villain right so i don't know much about hunters in the snow except for what i've read about in uh in books like shadows in eden and stuff but i am looking forward to these two and i i still have to buy the other two play scripts i mean <laughs> i was gonna get them for the holiday season but money was tight so i uh, I, I am definitely going to be buying the first two play scripts as well and i i got those from my mom for christmas so nice. I, I have them. Yeah, I'm excited about that. And and we actually have them coming up here uh, in the next few weeks. We'll be doing an episode about the magician. So um, looking forward that's to that. That's a good time. Yeah, yeah, that's a good time for me to get those play scripts. Um, yeah. Crazy Face is, is very interesting. It's It involves a character called Teal Erlenspiegel. And this character and this this character is from a book. Uh, written by, I think it was Charles de Coster. And it's actually an epic kind of book about this this hero called Till Olenspiegel. And it starts with him being baptized and uh, being baptized and coming home in the rain. And then everybody gets gets soaking wet. And then they, they, they go into the beer hall. And even the little boy gets to drink some beer to <laughs> ignite a fire in his belly. Um, it's a very interesting book. If you guys have a chance to buy this book, it's called Teal Eulenspiegel. I think it's by Charles de Coster. That, that, I believe that's the name. It's a very interesting book. It takes uh, place in... Um, um, it, it's, it's a very political book as well. It, it takes place... I think it's a Belgian classic, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I, I've read this book after I read Crazy Face from Clyde Barker's theater playbooks, you know, Incarnations and Forms of Heaven. And it was a really entertaining book. There's pirates... There's priests in cages. There's uh, guys pretending to be werewolves. 
there's all these like amazing stories and uh and until and Olin Spiegel has like a sidekick it's this really fat guy called Lemme and uh, he just loves to eat and that's that's his thing <laughs> and um it's kind of like a Don Quixote and Sancho Panza and it, it's it's a very interesting book you know find that read it because i think that's what really influence Clive to make this this play and uh, I just want to give that recommendation out cool nice yeah and uh, next up Hellbound Heart um, is being done as an audio play so that'll be really interesting I wonder if they'll uh, if they'll be sneaking in music from Hellraiser in there but yeah uh, Paul Kane and Baffle Gab Productions is making a, the, an audio play of the Hellbound Heart and it should be released sometime 2018 yeah that, that was surprising i mean we've announced it uh i think uh before in the in the blog and um uh, the only audio edition of the hellbound heart that existed was really the one that's read by clive barker right yeah and that one is really good but it, it's abridged so it's not yeah. a complete book so I'm, I'm looking forward to that Bethel gab seems to be um they know what they're doing with this sort of thing, and it's they, they, they're no beginners in where it comes to this sort of thing. So Paul Kane's involved, which is always a good thing. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I guess the next big news is really just news for us, but we're going to Texas. Woohoo! <laughs> and this kind of <laughs> also leads us into our, our discussion of Kickstarter. But yeah, we've made our, our final stretch goal, um, which is uh, going to Texas Frightmare Weekend to meet the Hellraiser cast and maybe Clive Barker if he makes it out there too. Yeah, that, that was very, very surprising. It's, again, every time we make a Kickstarter, it seems like it just keeps getting better and better. And, um, you know, Paul T. Taylor lives in Dallas. And uh-huh. so I asked him if he was going to be there, and he said, as far as he knows, no. And there may be huh. some politics involved in, in that, um, you know, because how much money somebody, you know, how much money somebody like Doug Bradley makes might depend on whether people are like, wait, which one of you is Pinhead? <laughs> that could be <laughs> confusing, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for, especially uh, if the movie people, does come out in February. For people who aren't experts on Hellraiser, they may not even understand, I guess. But they are having several Jasons that are going to be there at the same time. Uh huh. So who knows? Yeah. I mean, Kate maybe, Hodder is going to be there. It, I think that um, I think that Paul T. Taylor as Pinhead doesn't mean a whole lot until after the movie comes out, and they usually keep on announcing guests right up to the you know right up to the end. So. Maybe yeah. maybe he will get announced. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's nice to take a shot at returning to the place that inspired the podcast, right? And yeah. uh, it seems like we're all going to be there. The party is going to be <laughs> all of us, like you, me, David, who's with us today. Rob is probably going to go too, and yeah, uh, Marcus. is Marcus? Yeah. yeah. So the gang's going to be there, and we're gonna we're gonna meet up with people like uh, uh, Max Lichter of the Pyramid Gallery. Uh, people from Little Spark Films who made the book trailer for uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Servants of Hell that we posted about. Oh yeah, it, it, it's going to be a lot. Of, a lot of people. Lori, uh, the, the Lori who runs the Simon Banford uh, fans uh, <laughs> right. Facebook page yeah. is going to be there. She's <laughs> going to be cosplaying as Madame Butterball, and I think a moving man. Uh, from from uh, Clyde Barker's Book of Blood. I think yeah. Simon Benford played a movie man in that movie. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. I, I'm looking forward to that. It's like nice. I don't have a lot of experience with conventions in the United States, so for me it's going to be yeah. definitely uh, almost a first because the first one I saw was at the Hyatt in um, in uh, Berlin game. game. when I Yeah, when I went to see the, the Cabal Cut and I met... Um, I met Ann Bobby and uh, Russell Charrington. But that was really just the only thing I went there to do. And it wasn't the last day of the con, so everything was kind of like packing up. So uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've been to a bunch of them, but I don't I don't ever do cosplay because it seems like that stuff would just get in the way of trying yeah. to do interviews. <laughs> it, and... it seems like a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like why, you know, it's already tough to, for, for us, it's already tough lugging around all the recording equipment you know, and then on top of that, you know, to have 
to have to worry about a costume and I just know that if I had a costume I'd be knocking stuff over off of people's tables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I went to uh Days of the Dead Chicago, I thought it was already a nightmare enough just having a jacket <laughs> to deal with, yeah. let alone having a costume. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that um that bust that uh was made? There were only like three of them made of Narcisse. Um, uh huh. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I remember the ghostly hands tearing yeah. at uh, Narcissus's uh, scalp. So, so Russell had that on the table at uh, Monster Mania in New Jersey, and mm-hmm. I I was getting ready to go because it was Sunday and I was going to go to the airport. So I had my backpack on, and um, I had already been checked out of the hotel, and I was just kind of hanging around with Russell at the table for Occupy Midian, and and uh, I turned around and I almost knocked that onto the floor with my backpack. Oh my god. <laughs> so, that been terrible. So, so I think I caught yeah, but I caught it in time. But uh mm-hmm. yeah, it's like even so even just a backpack is difficult, so I can't imagine having a costume. Yep. You know, and all, all these people like to dress up like Decker. I mean, how do you see out of that? Uh geez, pinholes, I guess. Yeah. 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 But Perfectly uh placed pinholes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Simon Banford's going to be there. Barbie Wilde is going to be there. Nicholas Vince is going to be there. And, uh, you know, Clive announced he's going to be there. So we'll see about that. And Doug and Bradley. It, and Doug Bradley, right? Yeah, hey, the pinhead himself. We've never uh, never had him on the podcast yet. So I think that uh, that's something we want to work out. We'll be sure to be hounding around the tables and uh, try to get them because you got us press passes, right, Ryan? Yes. Yeah. So one interesting thing, and I don't really know the answer to this, but uh, Little Spark Film says that they go around and do interviews on Sunday. And um, but in the in the press pass application, they said don't do interviews during the convention. You do it like after hours. Uh So I don't know. I mean, they probably don't monitor you that well. So. We'll be able to plan that out uh, in yeah. time because that's going to take place in May. So there's plenty of time for that. You know, yeah. I know the time will creep up on us uh, pretty quickly, but uh, I, I, I don't even know where I'll be flying out from because right now we're facing this possibility of moving to Seattle if things go well. So we'll yeah. see. I know you already have like your your you already have like your flight all set up and you have an Airbnb place for us to, to hang out in. Uh, thanks to the Kickstarter and thanks to everybody who contributed to it and offered things to uh, to, to put up for uh, as 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 uh, rewards, right? Yeah. Uh, people like Pyramid Gallery, Marcus Williams, Peter Atkins, uh, who was generous enough to donate some really exciting uh, collectibles, and yeah, uh, yeah, and thanks yeah. to Don Bertram, who's going to be our sponsor again. That's what put us over to being able to go to Texas. That is nice. wonderful. And he lives in Texas, but I think in Austin, so he's um, pretty far away from from there. So I don't think he's going to be going to the to the yeah. um, to the convention. But yeah, funny funny thing about the Texas Drive My Weekend website, I think one of the pictures that they used for uh, uh, Simon Banford is is a picture that doesn't really look like Simon at all, but it was no. taken from this <laughs> short film that he was involved with, I think, where he plays yeah. like this guy with a shaped head and a big goatee. And it's like, I remember you saying, hey, who's that guy on the banner? Is that Simon Banford? It's like, <laughs> that doesn't look like him. And I was like, yeah, 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 that's him in one of the movies that he's made. But it's yeah. like, what a weird choice for them to use that one, because uh, clearly Simon Banford doesn't look anything like that right now. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I was reading comments, too, and other people were saying that also. They're like, is that Simon Banford? Who is that guy? Right, right. Hey, and another exciting thing is that Kevin Yeager, uh, the original director yeah. of Hellraiser Bloodline is also going to be there. So this might be a chance to get to talk to him if we catch him and get to ask him a few things about, you know, things that he might have uh, shot for Bloodline that never made the the, the ultimate Alan Smithy film, you know? Yeah. Uh, It'll that, be interesting to cool. see if he's willing to talk about Hellraiser Bloodline. I, I, yeah, because I, I, I don't think be. he's ever really talked about it all that much in the past, has he? No, no, he hasn't. I mean, I got in touch with a, a listener of our podcast recently, and he he sent me like some snippets of emails that he traded with Kevin Yeager recently, and that was interesting because he was he was going about describing uh, the duration of different cuts that he presented to the producers and stuff. So I was I was intrigued that he still remembers all that stuff in detail, and uh, 
we heard from Paul Kane that uh, for his upcoming book, Hellraisers, which was supposed to come out at the end of 2017, which I'm hoping is going to come out this year, but uh, Paul Kane told us that he did manage to secure interviews with Kevin Yeager, and they did talk about Hellraiser Bloodline. So that is something to look forward to. Yeah, I, I want a documentary on that film so bad. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. We're, we're working on it. We're working on it. Maybe this Texas Fragment <laughs> weekend will be a great opportunity to get some actual video stuff um, yeah. with Kevin Yeager. We'll see. Like Ryan that said, would, if he's willing amazing. to talk about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, and I think that's a good place to start is that uh, that guy that, that sent us the PM with emails and stuff. I mean, maybe that will be a, a good way to, to get in contact with him directly and, and schedule something. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. So we're going to Texas Fragment Weekend. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Ooh. And, and um, <laughs> but we do still need some help, um, you know, with uh, and we've got a lot of stuff left to get. So if you go over to... Our Kickstarter, if you do a search for Clive Barker on Kickstarter, we're the only one that's Clive Barker related. Um, but yeah, if you do a dollar or more, then you get thanks on the website. And if you do five dollars, I still have a lot of Imagica cards, and I'll just give you some random ones. The fewer people that do that, the more cards I'm going to give to people, just to let you know. But um, And so far, I think only two people have done that one. Um there's a, a patch for the hood house, and I'm thinking of taking that one off to keep. <laughs> but it's it's got a, the the hand of of Mr. Hood from uh, from the Thief of Always. Mm -hmm. um, we've got temporary tattoos. We have uh, oh, next testament number one. And, right. And uh, we have oh, the Imagica uh, card game. Posters. I still have four of those. Uh, yeah, the playing mats, right? Yeah, yeah. They're a playing mat on one side and a poster on the other side. Mm -hmm. I've always just used them as posters. I, I think it's great. I, I had one autographed by Clive Barker. And at the time, he said, what is this? I've never seen this before. And he asked me to, <laughs> to, to mail him one because wow. he, has to, like, he has to keep one of everything that he owns. Right, right, yeah. And we have uh, Imaginer 2 posters. I think you still have like 24 of those left. Uh, yes. We had, we had one person get one. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of the uh, the Don't Trust the Smiling World posters yeah. uh, that were made by Century Guild. That was a, a failed attempt to make some merchandise for the Clyde Barker Society, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, so there's there's a ton of those, and they they were our biggest seller last year, and we still have a lot more, so... And those are cool. It's got a Clive Barker quote. I mean, how often are you going to be able to put a Clive Barker quote up in your office? Yeah, that's true. And there is a medium-sized tank top um, with a Clive Barker sketch on, as the, the main artwork on it. Um, donated, thank you, uh, by Marcus Williams. And we have, oh, Clive Barker Society t-shirt. That's the one, the big one, one with the pinhead on the front. Yes, um, that's in uh, three. If we have three of them that are large, yes, yeah, three that are large, and then um, best cutler gallery prints. So that's the one that has the 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 sort of the three um, three paintings t next mm -hmm. to each other that depict like birth and and uh, middle age and death. We have a hardcover of the Scarlet Gospels, the U.S. edition. Um. Still to go, we have oh the Everville promo posters. There's one of those left, and I did set one aside for you, Jose, because I know you. Oh, want thanks. <laughs> it's really nice. I, you know, it's got a nice picture of Clive on it, and uh, I, I've I, I haven't seen many of those around. Yeah, yeah, to be honest, so that that looks pretty cool. You know, if there's one left, I mean, people better jump on that thing. I bought. It was weird. I bought this um, thing on eBay in the '90s that said like Clive Barker grab bag. And I thought, why not? And it was like 200 bucks. And I got mm -hmm. this huge pile of all these old posters and, and um, some and I and some like some books, the um, uncorrected proof books and stuff like that, that I've been, you know, over the years just giving away on the podcast or selling on our on our um, Kickstarters. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the quirkiest things that we still have on the Kickstarter rewards available is the temporary tattoos from the Thief of Always. I've never seen that. 
I've never seen that available anywhere else. I mean, was that like from the Clyde Barker store or something? Yeah, yeah, it was. And that was the the, the very last thing they did before they shut the store down. Uh, that is amazing. Sent us a box of, of stuff. Yeah. So we still don't know what's going on with that store, by the way. Uh, it yeah. may come back in a different form. So uh, we'll, we'll, I guess 2018 is going to be a, a year of, of changes. Oh, so we'll I, see. I meant to put this in the news, and I don't know what this means, but um, Phil and Sarah tweeted from real, the Real Clive Barker Twitter account. Okay. So I don't know. I mean, does that mean that maybe they're going to be taking over the store? That's a good uh, possibility, I would say. That's yeah. a good speculation. Uh, g- good job finding that tweet. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that means that they got access to it now. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah. I know. I'm still kicking myself for not getting the uh, pinhead coasters before the site oh, went Oh, yeah. Yeah, those were cool. <laughs> I wanted to get those, too. And you, you always yeah. think, oh, yeah, I've got lots of time. Or, yeah, know. just like I was like, yeah, I'll get to it when I get to it. And then yeah. it's gone. Yeah, yeah, like I, I, yeah, like I kept thinking, hey, I like the, the 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 clue cat pin from the Thief of Always. There was a little metal pin that was made, and I was like, I'm gonna get that one sometime. Yeah. And then it's like, oh no, now I don't have a chance to get that anymore. <laughs> but you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm sure there's still a lot of like merchandise available that they probably will. Whenever the, whatever incarnation of the story comes back, then I, I hope those things are gonna be there still. So yeah, we'll see. Okay, so and next we've got um, oh our T-shirt the 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 sort of a cream-colored one that has the 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 picture the illustration that you made the, of the yeah the, the the second T-shirt that we did for the second Kickstarter yeah the one with the island and the boat and the little guy and the giant skull with three eyes that seems like something out of the Aberat. We have two of two me or uh, one medium left. And two larges and two extra larges. Excellent. You know, I, I'm really proud of that design that we did, and I, I think it's a great T-shirt. And, uh, you know, it, it will really help us if you get got some more of those. I mean, we, we uh, usually only have them available for the Kickstarter. We don't usually have them available throughout the year just because there didn't seem to be a lot of demand for T-shirts. Uh, but... Yeah, we have to make those on demand. So, uh, you know, if you want one, jump on the Kickstarter and get one because this is your chance. Yeah. And I, and I really wanted to talk about the interview book um, because we sold some last year, but we haven't sold. Well, we sold one. Thank you, David, <laughs> this year so far. But we are hard at work on that interview book. And, and uh, we, now that we've got a big crew, we've recruit, recruited help with uh, transcribing these things into print. Mm-hmm. So we sh- we should definitely have it finished in 2018. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. My goal is if you know, there's a lot of things that have to get into place, but my goal is to have it finished by um, by the Clive Barker um, by the Texas Frightmare Weekend, and then maybe we could give one to Clive Barker in person. Yeah, wouldn't oh, that yeah, be something? Be cool. Yeah, that's something to look forward to and inspire us into working hard and, and finishing it soon. Yeah. yeah. So That's yeah, great. please get one of those. If you didn't get it last year, you know, I consider consider getting it. It'll be uh, a, it'll be an extremely limited only because we aren't selling very many. <laughs> you know, we don't want it to be limited, but it's it's turning out that way. Uh, it's only forty dollars, um, and it'll be a hardcover with a wraparound uh, cover. With and, the design by Clive Barker, yeah. with the uh, art by Clive Barker on the cover. And you're working on the the, the cover for that, right? Yes, yes. I have to send you guys some designs and see which ones we like the best. Okay. And uh, the the artwork is uh, Nightbreed related. And we were told that the creature that we were sent is supposed to be uh, Devil Lude's father. Yeah. So if you remember Devil Lude from Nightbreed, his dad's going to be on the cover of this book. Nice. And if you pledge sixty dollars, you can help plan an episode with us. And we've had people do that in the past, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and and you know, join us on the recording. And we've got for a hundred dollars uh, advertising, advertising for a one hundred or two hundred or three hundred dollars, depending on how many episodes and how long you want to have a banner on our website and stuff. And we've got one of those. Um, 
we've got one advertiser so far, but there's room for more. So, so that's it. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff here, and um, we still have nine days to go as we're recording this. I think it'll be eight by the time this gets posted. Uh, this episode gets posted. So, but yeah, we're you know we're we've got the bare minimum to cover Jose and I um, at Texas Frightmare Weekend, but now we've got five of us going. So. If you want to help uh, help out uh, the rest of the crew, that will that will uh, be a big help too. Yeah, we're currently at two thousand six hundred sixty nine, with forty three backers and nine days to go. So, yeah. thank you so much to all forty three backers who have helped us so far, and people who have donated stuff for our Kickstarter. Yeah. So next, I think we wanted to talk about uh, Clive Barker, the Art of Horror. If if anybody remembers this, it was first available as a VHS that you had to send away for you had to cut a proof of purchase out of your VHS box for Hellraiser 3 and send it in the mail, you know, like it was the top of a cereal box. And, uh-huh. uh, and then you would get that in the mail. And I, I did that. Um, so I actually got, I have a, a v, VHS copy of it. Uh, the, the internet movie database also says that it was available uh, only for purchase or rental with Hellraiser 3. Oh. So yeah, I guess you could also rent this if you rented Hellraiser three. And uh, uh, I wonder how yeah. many how many uh, video stores actually, you know, actually honored that. Yeah, I was gonna say it. Uh, my my video store, PJ's video store, I used to go to when I was a kid. I remember seeing this there, but I never got it. There you go. Yeah, and uh, you know, any big video store that would put up, you know, those stand stand up things and stuff, they they would usually get. Um, you know, uh, it would be kind of a package deal. If they buy this movie, then we'll send you some posters and we'll send you maybe a stand-up if they have some or whatever. And uh, it all depended on what sort of tier you were going to buy into, uh, number of copies and stuff, I guess. But, uh, yeah, the interne- um, uh, Paramount has since bundled this documentary with their release of Hell on Earth as a featurette. So uh, now it's available on Laser. It's no longer just on VHS. <laughs> And, hey Rob, Rob is joining us. It was it came out in 1992, uh, and then I think was it later in 2000? I think put on the DVD for Hellraiser three. I think so. I think it was whenever the Blu-ray came out for Hellraiser three. I'm not sure when exactly that was, but anyway, so this was directed by Christopher Holland, and it was narrated by Robert Russell. And it even features music by Christopher Young. It was a, kind of a Canadian production. It was a Zigzag Films Hollywood Canada production. Um, hmm. I think it's a great trip back in time. The narrator sounds British. Yeah, his name is Robert Russell. I think he's done some audio books too. But uh, so yeah, uh, you know, it's a very romantic documentary, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. It, it's Clive and yeah. very personable with him you know chill chilling out in his uh, leather jacket smoking a cigar yeah i know <laughs> with his spiked hair uh dressed in leather and yeah. just freaking the leather creaks throughout the entire documentary whenever he moves around <laughs> and, and when and else are you going to see a documentary where the narrator takes the time to read the entire instruction manual for a model kit yeah, right. yeah, that was one of my favorite parts, especially yeah. with the uh, kid cutting his finger, uh-huh. <laughs> the blood running down the model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was that was uh, the part where Clyde Barker was uh, reminiscing about doing Aurora kits when he was a kid, and then he was like, yeah. "Hey, and I just got in the mail this kit. Uh, I think it was a Screaming Collectibles kit that had Pinhead, and oh, yeah. he was just talking about that." And, uh, yeah, so uh, a very funny, well-shot documentary has these little these little tidbits that are produced uh, here and there, some montages, and uh, it's it's a very funny thing. And also, Clyde Barker is in his prime. You know, he's talking about Peter Pan, he's talking about his philosophy and art and what he thinks about of about life. It's um, yeah, I like it. Like, there's a part where he says that. Um, regarding his his writing and his characters he he said that uh, the characters in mythology and old legends they don't seem to have an inner life that we know about you know what we tend to care more about is the scale and the importance of the events they're a part of 
you know, the mythological quality of their story mm -hmm. as something where we can hang our own stories on them and try to draw lessons from them, you know. And, and so uh, in his own fiction, he, he does the bare minimum uh, to make a character believable. So he's like, nobody cares. Nobody, he was like, nobody cares if Oedipus brushes, how well Oedipus brushes his teeth or. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what's important is like the story that he's a part of. And yeah. I think that happens a lot in Nightbreed. Nightbreed has a very kind of uh, prophetic thing to it. You know, of course, we've mentioned this so many times before. But, uh, yeah, like, we don't know much about Boone. We don't know much about Laurie. We know just the bare minimum for them to take their place in the story and take their place in the the, the, the prophecy of, like, uh, Midian and what's going to happen to the Nightbreed. Yeah, and and I think that's what makes his writing so so fascinating to me cuz like me personally I'm not a big fan of Stephen King because I don't care about the material that's used to make the coffee mug that's sitting in the middle of the table mm -hmm. in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like I could do without all detail. that stuff. So yeah. if you read it, you have a character having a flashback and then within that flashback they're having another flashback. <laughs> Wow. And it's Inception. It, yeah, it's, yeah, the original it, Inception. It's too much. Wow. You you start to think, wait, where, where when is when is the present again? I forget. Yeah, you get disoriented really quickly. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of uh Brad Easton Ellis and and especially there's this book called American Psycho, which uh many people out there may oh, know that's about. It's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. But that book has paragraphs and paragraphs about Patrick Bateman's routine in the morning and what sort of like face scrub cream, he's going to use and, creamer and creams and yeah. stuff and shower brands and the cost and everything, yeah, the brands and the shirt. And then he's going to put a comme des garçons shirt and then he's going to use like some uh, Ralph Lauren, this and that. And it's like you go through that thing, but it's like it, it makes sense reading it because it's supposed to be about someone who only cares about the surface of things. And yeah, and yeah. it's very super. So that makes sense for the, the story, but uh, and it also kind of adds to the humor of, of yeah. the story, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, absolutely, because he's he's totally like obsessed with that. Yeah, but <laughs> in, in this documentary, there's a lot of interesting things. Like you can read the, you can hear the real voices of Sean Chapman and Oliver Smith. Yeah, whenever you see, um, uh, from uh, Hellraiser. Uh, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's that is I knew I'd heard the so that's where you hear the voices of those guys. I knew I'd heard them somewhere. I thought it was the trailers, but it's not. Uh, it is also I think the I think an early Hellraiser trailer has There is an international trailer where you can hear uh, uh, maybe that's Oliver heard. Smith's voice as Frank the Monster and yeah. stuff like that. I so, thought yeah, I'd that gone was... beyond the limits, but I hadn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it, yeah. it's it's similar to to what you hear in the in the movie, but it's not you know not a hundred percent the same. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so in, in in some of these uh, moments where Clive is expounding on his philosophy, he goes on to describe his vision of art as something that pushes boundaries and constructs culture. And not just pop culture, but even highbrow high culture, right? I mean, and it does this by moving us and touching us and taking us to places that are not necessarily through a, a rational process, but a process that it's creative and it erupts spontaneously. And, and nobody really knows where those things come from. And, and that happens to him a lot when he's painting and uh, writing. Sometimes the characters jump out and have a life of their own. And, he, the, you know, wherever you read about the process of creation and creativity and stuff like that it's especially if you if you think about um i, I want to bring david lynch into the conversation because david lynch has this idea about meditation and letting ideas kind of kind of float up in in your mind like the, the catching the fish right it's catching the big fish catching the idea yeah. and i think some of the biggest creators they can't really tell you where their ideas come from it's one of those silly questions, cliche questions that people bring to the table whenever they have a chance to interview someone who creates a lot of stuff. It's like, where do you get your ideas? And it's oh, like yeah. probably one of the worst questions you can ask someone because <laughs> often know, they, they can't even tell you that because yeah. it's like it's a process that... They don't that, really know uh, themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. Yeah. part of the process. I've, yeah, been, to, I've just, been to like 12 Clive Barker signings and there's always... Oh, so many people always go up there. Where do you get your ideas from? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> there should be a special line for that. <laughs> yeah. you know, this special is the, line, the yeah. where the where do your ideas uh-huh. come from? Line starts yeah. over. Here. Yeah, <laughs> I steal them. <laughs> um. So so yeah, it's uh, he thinks that fantastic fi- fiction should be a way to drive us back to our humanity instead of just. Um, I think Clive is not a big fan of Lovecraftian mythology. Like he says at one point that he doesn't think fantastic fiction should be about um, uh, showing us as mere puppets and uh, to this this. Oh uh, yeah, that we're nothing, these, right? Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, these giant like uh, entities that are just. He doesn't like that. He wants fantastic fiction to be a way to drive us back to our humanity. I th- I think that his stories do that, especially in oh, the yeah. Book of Blood. And, I think and they that, go a step beyond, right? They show uh, us that we can still be human, but part of something more complex and beautiful and fantastic, like uh, in the hills, the cities, right? I, and I think that, oh, yeah. um, in fact, in a lot of Clive Barker's stories, the the main bad guy is trying to show humans that we're nothing, you know, that we're just made out of like mud and shit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh-huh. But then, but then the 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 human main characters prove that you know that that people are magic that we have this sort of creative magical um uh, drive within us yeah that's a that's an excellent point yeah but uh, yeah this was super nostalgic for me because i think that this was right around that this this came out right around the time that i was starting my clive barker collecting and I loved this videotape. I watched it over and over again. And it was, watching it now made me realize how much of it I actually had memorized and I'd forgotten about. And I just didn't remember where all that came from. But it was all from this video. A lot of, I, uh, a lot of my understanding of Clive and his work really came from yeah. this. Yeah. I, I did a, a scene of the week for the podcast where I talked about the Droolies. The yeah, Droolies. Yeah, yeah show up in this uh, documentary around the, the 19 minute mark um, and it's 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 cool because the droolies were something that Clive um, you know just these creatures that he would draw as far as the as early as the late 80s and uh, he made them for a taboo magazine that was published by spider baby graphics in 1989 uh, he was one of the people who wrote the, the frontispiece of the issue and he intro- he wrote the introduction for issue number one. It was uh, I think this magazine was edited by Stephen Bissett, who was also um, involved with DC Comics and Swamp Thing and stuff like that. So, yeah, the Droolies. Uh, here's here's a quote about the Droolies. Said Ah, the Droolies. That was a joke, really. I sent it along to John Tottlebun and Steve Bissett to prove I have an extremely ludicrous side. And this was a, a quote from Clyde Barker in a, an article by Chris Brayshaw for Dis, Discorder 1990. So um, Phil and Sarah Stokes do mention the Droolies in their book project section. And they said it, it was supposed to be a color illustration and text published by Steve Bissett and Taboo, adding to the list of children's projects that never materialized. This looks to have been a manifestation of the Monsters Under the Bed story. <laughs> so... <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. I, I wish yeah. we could have seen more of the Droolies. Yeah, and they look cool. They do. They yeah. look cool. Even though and there's narration they, that sounds like it's quoted from Clive Barker that you it know is. Is, is, hasn't been published as far as we know. It, it's from a illustration of the Droolies, and there's a caption underneath written by Clive, and it says, oh. Very few things are as bad as you fear they'll be. This the Droolies knew. So they were experts at making you believe the worst. Huge eyes that seemed in the dark to belong to a much bigger and more ferocious animal. Teeth that were made for gnashing but were bad at gnawing. Fingers <laughs> that felt when they touched in the back of your neck as cold and as deep sea slimy as an octopus's kiss. But it was all in the mind. The droolies, when seen in daylight, were pale, thin, apologetic creatures whose worst trait was a nervous and insipid giggle. And then Clive wrote, Tee hee! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a little drooly in the back with a little yeah. bubble saying "tee hee." <laughs> That's funny. That is funny. I like that stuff. Yeah, I, I wish that more had been done with it. But you know, there's a lot of Clive Barker stuff that you kind of wish had more had been done with. The droolies kind of remind me a little bit of the Jump Tribe in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the 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 this documentary has also has the entire uh, the entire uh, trailer for Hellbound. 
which watching that again is like that's a really good trailer i mean i think that uh it it does a really good job of of showing all the best um you know interesting stuff in in hellbound and it and it really delivers what it promises you know it's got yeah. some other problems but uh but but that's it's a it's I like a, the way, it tells I like you the, all the good stuff about it i like the way that trailer ends when it kind of goes into like a circle yeah it's like thirsty yeah. screaming that was pretty cool yeah, yeah that there's moments where they touch base also on uh, on rawhead wrecks and transmutations, and Clive talks about the Green Man production company, yeah. and ultimately how that led him to wanting to make his own movie, and that's how Hellraiser was born. Um, yeah, so. it's hard to get too angry with the Green Man team if they, uh, you know, they, you know, unintentionally inspired Hellraiser. Yeah, yeah, it's true, yeah. and. You know, as part of our upcoming uh, year in review, I just want to say that Rawhead Rex did have a 4K restoration. And it it was, for me, I'm going to put that as one of the memorable moments of 2018, was me Mm -hmm. actually being able to go see Rawhead Rex, as much as Clive hates that movie. But uh, I'm I'm glad that that movie exists. I think it's a a fun movie. And uh, so Transmutations, on the other hand, is really boring. It is really boring. But uh, my favorite part of the documentary, though, I mean, Clive, there's so many great quotes from him. Mm -hmm. But the one that just it's now probably one of my all time favorites is when he's talking about, you know, his his work on transmutation when they're putting the movie together and everything. And he says, everything is foreplay until the movie is finished. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great. Yeah. (laughs) And, And he's talking about the production and he's talking about all the changes that were done. And then he says, and where the orgasm was, I can't tell you. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like, <laughs> yeah. I, I missed, missed out on that part. But uh, yeah. yeah, so, so yeah. And, and um, that, that line that, you know, somebody, and then somebody came to me and said, it seems like you're making a horror movie. And, and it's like, well, that's, that's what, what you hired you're... me to do. Yeah. yeah. Like, but no, it was say, supposed to be a rock and roll musical. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like they get they. It seems there's not a lot of readers. The producers don't read the scripts when they get involved with these people, yeah. and and that seems to kind of be a common theme. I've heard that same kind of story. And that was yeah, they want the like, elevator pitch. They don't want to have to read. That was only like 1985. Yeah. I think probably almost all the people involved in that movie didn't even know who Clive Barker was. Yeah, that's a good guess. Yeah, they only knew that he was a hot thing at the time, and they just wanted. That's him to it. Get yeah, that's yeah. It, exactly. He yeah. Well, it. Rob, yeah, uh, sometimes producers don't read that stuff. They give it to like their assistants and they they just want to have like a short, you know, shortened version of what the movie's about. And I know for a fact that you know, uh some people just want to read treatments or shortened versions of the script and you know, they just rely on their assistants to give them like the compact version of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember uh, Kevin Smith, he wrote a uh when he wrote uh his script for uh, Superman Reborn. It was like a 55 page mm-hmm. uh, uh, wow. treatment. And they told him, it was like, what, what is this? They were like, well, that's my treatment. I'm like, well, you know, it's only supposed to be two pages. Right? <laughs> <Yeah. So laughs> oh my God. That's, that's like a great it. story that has that producer yeah. that wants the big spider at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> Have you seen that documentary? Whatever happened to, yeah. uh, what's great documentary. I recommend Yeah, whatever happened to Superman reborn, reborn or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, that man. is so cool, especially the Tim Burton parts. That yeah. producer's name is John Peters. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, because then yeah. he eventually got his spider in... in uh, uh, what's the movie uh, he got it in? Wild Wild, Wild, West. Wild West. Well, that was a big mechanical spider, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. still, he got the idea of his <laughs> spider <in laughs> there. Well, Ryan, spiders are the largest predators of the insect world. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's like, the reference, yeah. Someone needs to let this guy to stop, stop watching like... Uh, was it because he had said, uh, well, I'll, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but it was just ridiculous. The whole situation was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and Clive goes into, um, in Cold Heart Canyon, he really kind of digs into this, you know, underbelly of Hollywood and and this, you know, it, it's the stuff that's rocks that are kind of getting turned over in, in real life right now. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting moment when Clive says that he spent five months in L.A. recently and he was like, I was there and I could see all these people and all they do is go to the gym and work out for five or six hours a day. And then they just want to get tan and they just want to look good, but they're intellectually starved. And and he talks about L.A. in a way that 
kind of makes it seem like it's a, a very superficial city. But then he ended up living there for the rest of his life. And yeah, yeah <laughs> I only wonder just how a couple of years after that, after they yeah. made that movie. Right, right. Um, so I, some quotes that are really good. One of them is like, we care about the craft that we're involved in. He's talking about writing. We care about it because it can communicate to a large numbers of people because it has some power to change the world, which I think it's one, you know, describes exactly why, um, you know, writing is important. And uh, and not yeah. just writing fiction, you know, writing, you know, other things like uh, history and writing science and all that. Writing really is the thing that was a game changer for our society because it allowed knowledge and stories that were just relying on oral tradition to be passed down to another generation and accumulated. So and, and religion too. Yeah. Cuz the sure. the printed word is uh what was it the Lutherans where you had to be able to read and understand it in order to be able to get to heaven and all that stuff which helped further along the printed word. Mm. Yeah, like the uh, the copying monks that mm -hmm. would spend decades in the the monasteries just copying books and making copies of it and yeah. learning how to read and if you wanted to learn how to read then you better join the clergy because that's the only way you're going to be able to learn how to read yeah. during the dark ages and uh, <laughs> jeez yeah i know just teach people to read it doesn't have to be like some kind of you know well you have it, to join this yeah, yeah. you didn't have to read to be a farmer i guess that's what they that's what yeah, the nobles thought in the clergy they were like well just let him be Naive and dumb as rocks, and just keep living their lives. Yeah, yeah. that's true. We're we're having a problem now where Joey stays up all night reading. He just we, we when when we're trying to get him up in the morning, and he's got this huge pile of books on the floor. <laughs> that's a good problem to have. Yeah, I was gonna it's, say that's a really good problem. It's better than being problem. addicted to the tablet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a very, very cool documentary. Um, mm -hmm. You can watch it at the Seraphim Inc. YouTube uh, channel. And uh, it's there's lots of other cool stuff there to, to watch about Clyde Barker. And for some reason, it has four thumbs down, which I don't understand. Oh, come on. <laughs> like, who would do that? <laughs> YouTube commenters are the worst. I don't understand. Yeah. yeah. yeah there's but, a uh, special uh, place in hell for... <laughs> YouTube commenters, yeah, yeah, I hope so. yeah there is. They're um, pretty are so, hungry. They're bad. <laughs> and there's a final montage as the narrator reads like a, an excerpt from the Damnation game. I think it's from the opening of part five, and uh, it's the part where it talks about the deluge going into the city, and then you know, and and then what I think is really interesting is that the Clyde Barker says something here. It says he's talking about. Um, you know, uh, how sometimes uh, miracles happen not necessarily in uh, big palaces and, and you know, uh, important places. But he goes on to say that there are, it's true, some freakish occurrences to be recounted, but most of them take place in backwaters, in ill-lit corridors, in shunned wastelands among rain-sodden mattresses and the ashes of old bonfires. They are local, almost private. Their shockwaves at best made gossip among wild dogs. That sounds Most like of, something from the Books of Blood, isn't it? It's from Damnation Game. Oh, Damnation Game. Okay, there we go. And it says, Most of these miracles, however, games, reigns, and salvations, were slipped with such cunning behind the facade of ordinary life that only the sharpest sighted or those in search of the unlikely caught a glimpse of the apocalypse showing its splendors to a sun-bleached city. And it's like, damn, man, this is like Clyde Barker in his prime, dude. It's, yeah. it's, it's The Damn Nation game has so much. This is the kind of thing that I used to say, you know, Clyde Barker's prose sounds almost like poetry, you know, the, yeah. the, the musicality of it. It's so beautiful. And, uh, yeah, that, that's a great uh, quote to end the documentary in. And they, they, they put together this beautiful montage of things, of images, and um, great stuff. The art of horror. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder it, what what was what what made you know what prompted them to make this because it was it was basically free, um, you know. Yeah, I just paid shipping for it, um, I, and it, it was only you know it was only like eight years later that it got put onto the DVD for Hellraiser three. Yeah, it's just promotional stuff, I guess. It's just yeah. you know making. Something interesting for Clyde Barker fans right. to watch. I mean, now yeah. nowadays it's a it's 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 a featurette, but back then, yeah. I mean, their featurettes didn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
except in rare like VHS releases, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only the first time I saw I have seen it, but it was on that DVD for the American release. There was I do release remember, by, Go ahead. No, you're I'm just gonna say you're the, if y'all were y'all were kinda conflicting on which I think it was the D V D release. The first D V D release of Hellraiser Three. Mm-hmm. I think that's when it was released. And I remember one other time where I saw something like this at the video store where if you rented the Matrix, you could also get for free like a, a commentary on the or like a documentary about the Matrix. Oh, that sounds familiar. Um, Entering the Matrix or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Or no, I think Enter the Matrix is a. That was the anime game. collection. Oh, that's right. Okay. It's the anime did Matrix. It, did that yeah. documentary oh, right. the Matrix yeah. show how they did the bullet time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think I saw that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, when when VHSs were sort of on their way out, they had to try to come up with a way to compete with DVDs, so they had documentaries that you could just rent, you know, simultaneously with the with the movies. Yeah. Or sometimes even after the movie was done, there could be like a little extra at the end. Like, uh, yeah, you remember the that? Credits. Yeah, especially to sell merchandise, like uh, that, <laughs> Hell that Hellraiser Raiser. thing. Yeah, Watch where there's and a wear offer from Hellraiser. <laughs> yeah, an old lady and her cat Percy and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. Ooh, that fun. satin against your skin. You know you <laughs> want the Hellraiser satin jacket. <laughs> Man, I wish I had one of those. All those voices were kind of strange. I mean, they try to sell things. They were just weird. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I was really tempted to go through the Kickstarter stuff doing that, but then yeah. I, I started to write it, and then it, and then it's like, ah, oh, this isn't you know, people. This would get old after a while. No, that'd have been great. That voice, yeah, would it, it'd have been pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, would have been in support of that. It was hard hey, to come up with puns and jokes for every single thing on our Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Rob, I wanted to, to say uh, thanks for making that article about the play scripts that are coming out. And you put at the end something really cool um, f- from the Clyde Barker archive. You mentioned that they put up something about Hellraiser Bloodline. They had like a little storyboard image of the Chatter Beast uh, chasing uh, someone in the movie. Remember that? Yes, I was uh, chasing Bobby. Yeah, uh, and yeah. a coolest thing also is that I think it was you that posted that on our page that someone uh, on YouTube put up a behind-the-scenes video of the animatronic Chatter Beast. No, it's a it's a costume, right? Yeah, it's a person in a suit. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah they so, hired an actress, yeah. That is really cool. I didn't know that there was that behind-the-scenes clip uh, anywhere, so that was an interesting surprise for me to, to see that video. That was really, really I got really that sick. from a, a fan uh-huh. that recently I was talking to about uh, a Razor Bloodline. Yeah. It's named it's Kyle, it's Kyle Hart. For like, um, so thanks, Kyle Hart, Hart for FX, sending that out. Right? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, sure. And Kevin Yeager also has, like, uh, replicas and props on his website, and I think some of them are related to Hellraiser Bloodline. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have to go check buy out. on his uh, official website the the masks the people wear, were wearing at the ball mm-hmm. that was deleted from the, the ball sequence that was deleted from Bloodline. He's selling the mask oh. like a set for, like, $800. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And that's not, the, that's not a bad prize considering it's actual movie prop. Yeah, uh, and he was selling a, a Jacques uh, bust that they were going to mm-hmm. use for when a it was, you know when he was going to have his when he was going to de age his de aging sequence and it's but most of the flesh has come off the bust so it's only going for like two hundred and fifty dollars so that's again that's not a bad price for yeah, like that's, to have something like that's that pretty good. Yeah, I've only seen the the pictures of the mold that they used to make that, but I haven't seen the picture. Yeah, of the there's bust like just yet. a little pieces of flesh left on it, and I wow. that's cool. You know, it looks yeah, like a. Cool. A little article about Hellraiser Bloodline has to has to come up on the blog soon. I have to go check that out. Yeah, right, right. We could put all of that stuff together. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, that was uh, Clyde Barker's The Heart of Horror documentary. And uh, I, I think, does anybody have anything else to add to it? Um, I was just going to say that, 
you know, we've seen the Stephen King quote a million times, you know, about Clive Barker being the future of horror. Yeah. And it's it's so weird, especially now to see it, considering the uh, resurgence of Stephen King and how he had like this unprecedented year in 2017. But I'm just hoping that everything else is coming full circle and we're going to see Clive's year in 2018 or 2019. Amen. Great. I agree with that. That's to be. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I think the one thing I learned from – I remember one thing I learned from The Art of Horror. I mean this is a long time ago, but I remember it because it was just talking about how Clive said if you ever have – you know, when you're writing dark ideas or I'm kind of summarizing what he says. Maybe it's not from this, but maybe y'all can help me. Uh, yeah, yeah, you just recently watched it, but uh, he says something about don't ever – if you have dark ideas, just you know, go with it or explore yeah. it and – does he say something along those lines in that? Yeah, he Can't. talks about I mean, the, the he talks about the fantastique out. and uh, you know how how these ideas are are things that uh, he finds attractive. Uh, yeah, like he especially he starts talking about um, the forbidden and stuff like that. Uh, anything that's taboo that he always finds mm-hmm. irresistible. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and he talks about television wants to, doesn't want to be original. It wants to be the second to do everything. And he yeah. says, but uh, he says he thinks that there's an audience out there for original work, even though people may not think that that that's true. It really is. Yep. And you know, another thing I learned from this documentary is that Clive is classic cool man. He's got charm. He's got wit. <laughs> yeah, he's sharp. Definitely. Yeah. Smoking a cigar with a stylish spike hair, business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> he got a nice mullet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's got that weird mullet thing going on. Yeah. Luckily, he changed from that. But uh, yeah. So that's Art of Horror. You know, go go check it out. We'll put a video on this uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and uh, Seraphim, it's on Seraphim's official YouTube channel, so it's uh, legitimate. And I think a good companion to that is something that's also on the Seraphim channel. It's called Horror Cafe, where you can see Clive develop a story at a table with people like uh, 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 Carpenter, I think, and uh, uh, Corman, and uh, all these other people. <clears throat> and it, it's uh, it was a really interesting uh, show that they did. And go check it out as well. It's called Nightmare Cafe, Horror Cafe. And it's Cafe. Wes Craven, too, right? Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. That's Wes Craven, and it's uh, Roger Corman. I think Lisa Tuttle is in it, and Peter Atkins is in it as well. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, cool. Go check it out. All right, and this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. Find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com where we have news and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and every other place you can find podcasts. The Clive Barker Podcast is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.